So, so let's get started. Um, my name is Sven Biker. I'm the executive director of the Center for Automotive Research here on Stanford campus. And um, I'm working on a lot of different things regarding the future of the automobile. One topic being alternative energy and electric vehicles. And it's my great pleasure today to have such an esteemed panel here to look a little bit more uh, at the future of electric uh, vehicles and where trends are going. Uh, so some of you might think, OK, an electric vehicle panel again. And in fact, when um, Professor Jim Sweeney and I discussed what we wanted to do at this panel, it wasn't really that easy. Because um, one way or another, we all know that electric vehicles are supposed to be the cleaner vehicles. But it really depends where your electricity comes from. One way or another, we also know that electric vehicles might be a big challenge for the electricity grid, depending on how many vehicles in what accumulation we will see in the public. And we also know one way or another that consumers are concerned regarding range, cost, and the charging infrastructure of electric vehicles. So, so there are all these questions that have been discussed already a lot. And we thought, what can we do today? And basically what we want to highlight that the answer to these questions depends highly on one group. And that's actually all of you. It's you as consumers, it's you as decision makers in industry, in government, in public and private services. And this is why we wanted to discuss with you a little bit. And hence, Professor Jim Sweeney and I came up with a title for this panel, which is Vehicle Electrification, Who Should Care, Why, When, and How Much? Um, so we have a great panel here, and I want to briefly introduce our esteemed panelist. Uh, right to my left, I have Tilo Koslowski, who is the vice president and automotive practice leader at Gartner. Uh, there he leads the automotive industry analysis group and advises strategists in the automotive industry on guiding and growing their business. Prior to that assignment, he used to be a consultant with Gartner Consulting, and he also was holding various marketing and strategy positions for a premium European automotive manufacturer. He's an education background as an MBA in marketing and production engineering and European economy at Technical University Aachen in Germany. Thanks for coming, Tilo. Thank you very much. Then we have David Peterson, who's the West Coast EV project manager and corporate planning with Nissan North America. And uh, there he's responsible for electric vehicle market readiness and deployment in the Western United States. Previously, uh, he led the electric vehicle research at the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation. And he was also a financial analyst with ING Bank in Shanghai. He holds a master's degree from UCLA and a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley. Thanks for coming, David. And then further to the left, we have Pat Romano, who's the president and CEO of Coulomb Technologies. Formerly, he was the president and CEO of Two Wire, and he also held several engineering and marketing positions at Polycom. He holds an undergraduate degree in computer science from Harvard University and a master's degree from the MIT Media Lab. And then, last but definitely not least, uh, John Tillman, Manager and Regulatory Affairs at Daimler, where he's involved in government regulatory activities around electric mobility and de development of long-term scenarios and strategies for introduction of advanced vehicle technologies in the United States. He has actually been in the electric mobility technology of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles for about 13 years now. Uh, not all the time at Daimler, but also at Volkswagen, Hyundai, and the UC Davis Institute for Transportation Studies. He actually holds a bachelor degree in science, chemical and electrical engineering from UC Davis. So I'm sure you agree with me, we have a very esteemed panel here today uh, to discuss the topic of electric vehicles, who should care, why, when, and how much. The way how we want to do this I discussed with all panelists in preparation for this meeting here today a few questions uh, that we want to use in order to moderate uh, uh, this about 50 minute long conversation now. But first, I was asking all participants to make a quick statement 
uh, where they will basically highlight what is happening in their respective field regarding vehicle electrification. Um, if they think that electric vehicles are already being overhyped or maybe still underappreciated, and what they see if they look at the electric vehicle market and infrastructure in the year 2020. So we will do this, everyone will do about a two or three minute statement in that field, and then we will do a moderated discussion for about 30 minutes, and that should still allow for about 15 minutes of questions from the audience, which we will be happily taking for further conversations then. With that, I would like to start with uh, Tilo and tell us a little bit more about your background at Gartner and um, what you do in the field of electric vehicles and also what you see when you look at the electric vehicle market in the year 2020. Is it overhyped? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for, for the introduction and uh, great to be here with the panelists and of course with you, the audience as well. Um, I've been in this field for a long time as well. I founded Gartner's automotive practice in uh, 1999 on the analyst side, and even prior to that on the Gartner Consulting side, since 1997, I've been looking into technologies and how they apply to the automotive industry in all kinds of different areas, including powertrain technologies. And even prior to working at Gartner, I actually used to work for a car company that was looking into hybrid vehicles, and even to some extent, electric vehicles, as early as 1994, 1993. So a lot of the car manufacturers have been working on some of these battery technologies obviously for a long time. That specific company that I worked for couldn't actually figure out how to make it work financially to bring out a vehicle and to really have something that consumers would find mostly interesting. And you know, to your question in terms of what does that mean today, where do we stand with all of this, I think ultimately there is a role for the electric vehicle to play, definitely. There's no question about this, but the question is how big is this role? going to be short-term, mid-term versus long-term. And I actually believe that going forward, there's still a lot of hurdles that have to be taken, primarily from a consumer acceptance point of view. I'm not so worried about the infrastructure. That's still an issue that needs to be resolved as well. But first, we have to figure out how to make these cars really attractive for consumers. And we'll share a little bit more. I will share a little bit more information about what we see. We do a lot of studies with consumers, too, and we talk a lot to the car companies and the suppliers with regards to their technology preferences and their point of views. The connected or the electric vehicle will definitely be a real topic, continue to be a real topic going forward, but a lot of hurdles still need to be taken. I think right now there is a little bit of a hype. Okay. Well, thanks, Tilo. Well, next, um, I'd like David maybe to tell us a little bit more about your background at, at Nithan, Nissan of North America, a little bit about your field regarding electric vehicles. Obviously, the, the Nissan Leaf is a big topic there, but also maybe if you can share a few thoughts where you see this field going to the year 2020, overhyped or underappreciated. Sure. So I work in corporate planning at Nissan North America, and so we do midterm business planning, developing new business um, for specifically zero emission um, mobility. And at Nissan, we've had tremendous success with the Nissan LEAF. Um, in the United States, it's uh, been available since December 2010, and to date we've sold 13,000 units, 30,000 units worldwide, um, and it still remains the lowest cost electric vehicle on the market in its class, despite several new, new models coming to market and uh, announcements by different auto OEMs. Yet we still believe the price is too high, and in line with our objective um, of making an affordable, mass-market electric vehicle, um, we're localizing production um, in several key markets around the world. In the United States, we're localizing production in Smyrna, Tennessee, where we'll have the largest EV plant uh, for the Nissan LEAF um, in the world uh, for Nissan. Um, it will have an annual production capacity of 150,000 Nissan LEAFs and 200,000 battery packs. And as you could probably infer from from the size of these plants, of, of the Smyrna plant in particular, um, economies of scale of production are an important element to bringing down vehicle costs. Um, but electrification has been happening in the automotive industry for quite some time. And I think this is part of the problem with our industry is that we're sending mixed messages, um, or we're not sending a consistent message about what vehicle electrification means. Does it mean hybrid vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, fuel cell? Uh, hydrogen vehicles? Does it mean battery electric vehicles? And so what does the electrification of transportation or of cars actually even mean? And so to this end, we've confused, I believe we've confused the public um, to a certain extent, and so I believe that they're underappreciated uh, by mm -hmm. the general public and that the news media has generally overhyped electric vehicles. Um, the news media, I believe, has expected things to happen too quickly 
or, didn't, or things didn't happen as quickly as the news media expected them to happen. And every time I meet somebody, somebody new who's not familiar with the industry, um, and they ask me, so tell me about the Nissan Leaf. It doesn't take any gas, but it has, a, it has an engine, right? So people are just generally confused about the technology. They think it's a hybrid vehicle. They don't know. They hear electrified, but they don't know what that really means. They still think it's a hybrid. So I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of consistent messaging and getting, um, and just generally consistent messaging. But the thing is, is that most consumers don't pay attention um, to, to what's happening in the automotive industry unless they're in the market to buy a car. And people are in the market to buy a car on average every six years. And so you can see how this is a long, term process. I mean, Nissan's taking a very long position on EV technology because we recognize that to reach the 10% of consumers that we want to reach by 2020, excuse me, 10% of new vehicle sales that we want to attain by 2020, um, we're going to have to do a lot of work on educating uh, the general public. And to this end, we're working a lot in the EV ecosystem, working with um, many of those here on, on stage on uh, developing things such as residential workplace and public charging infrastructure. Um, Nissan has brought its own DC quick charger to market. It's the lowest cost DC quick charger available. And we're continuing to expand financial, non-financial incentives, and all of this with the goal of selling a profitable, zero emission car that people love to drive. Great, thanks, thanks David. Appreciate it a lot for coming. Uh, actually, you mentioned charging infrastructure. That's a great segue to, to Pat Romano, President and CEO of Coulomb Technologies. Pat, if you don't mind, tell us maybe a little bit more about how your company fits into the electric vehicle um, electrification space. And also, if you see something like, is this field being overhyped, underappreciated? And uh, where do you see things going within the next eight years, so year 2020, our crystal ball sure. kind of attempt? First, first thanks. Thanks, Ben, for, for hosting the panel, and thank you all for your attention. Um, a little bit about Coulomb Technologies. Uh, our public brand is uh, ChargePoint, so if you've uh, happened to cross a public charging station with the ChargePoint logo on it, that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, it's uh, not very well understood in the industry what role we play, even though we're, we're uh, fairly visible out there uh, with our name attached to uh, many chargers out there in, in the North American market especially. Um, we provide uh, turnkey networking services so anyone that wants to offer uh, charging services to drivers that may use their parking lots, um, uh, they, they can do that in an easy turnkey way and delegate all those responsibilities essentially to us to manage that network. Um, in our opinion, uh, drivers need consistent infrastructure. They need to be able to have a few relationships with companies like us that deal with payment remittance and notification of what your charging session is currently looking like so you can get some information say on your mobile phone while you're while you're charging your car because it's important to know when things like that uh, are finished or if there's been an issue um, drivers need to be able to find stations so we provide those services in fact we're integrated with most vehicle telematic systems right now we're, we're providing feeds to not only the station location, but also the station status. Navigating, for example, to a station that's occupied isn't that useful. And given that this is a parking model, uh, especially with respect to level two charging, not a pumping model as, as it was with a, a liquid fuel, um, it, people are parked in those spots for a long time, in many cases longer than it takes to charge the car. Um, so it's important uh, for us to provide those services to get the ecosystem sufficiently seeded with uh, things like that so that uh, these two gentlemen here can successfully sell cars uh, and then we in turn can successfully sell more stations uh, and, more, and more network services, which is really our thrust. Um, we uh, uh, believe wholeheartedly that uh, the market is, uh, is, is a parking model for level two charging. Um, it is not a find the nearest gas station and see DC chargers fill in those uh, gas stations and replace gas pumps over time. There will be certainly a place for DC charging in this that, and it will play a significant role, but the bulk of the chargers that most of us that drive EVs will run into uh, will be level two chargers because in most parking lots you're parked there for a long enough period of time, greater than one hour, uh, for, that to, uh, for that to be beneficial. Uh, it's a top-off model, in our opinion. We're seeing that on our network. We have 
you know, uh, tens of thousands of drivers on our network already that are that are that are using um, using you know charge point services to uh, find and, and manage their their charging sessions. And what we're seeing is the average session time is quite long. Um, it's it's multiple hours, um, especially in the workplace. What we're also seeing is that there's a heavy heavy dependency on workplace charging. And this is a message that I've sent to not only our state governments, but our, our federal government as well, is incentive programs to get workplaces to put in uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure is such an incentive for drivers to actually take the plunge and buy an electric vehicle. Uh, the commute to work is the most important decision factor. Um, what we're seeing in the state of California is, is carpool lane access being granted to a lot of different EVs. Uh, that are either out or emerging, and, and that's a big incentive to get them over the initial cost hurdle. But more importantly, if they can't, uh, if they can drive to work in the in the carpool lane, is a nice incentive for a while as this market gets off the ground. But they can't get to work and plug in and get enough juice to drive home. It's immaterial, right? And so I think uh, the takeaway here is while we're seeing it in cities, towns, retailers across the board, workplace charging on the front end of this market is going to be the most important. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. And you mentioned already regulation and incentive systems and so on. Maybe a good cue for, for John <laughs> Tillman, a manager of regulatory affairs at Daimler and based in uh, Sacramento. Um, tell us a little bit more maybe about your work regarding electric vehicles, maybe also advanced powertrains in general because you, you do not just cover electric vehicles. Uh, so there's quite a, quite a large portfolio. So a little bit about this and, and also what you see regarding electric vehicles more specifically maybe being overhyped or underappreciated and maybe the year 2020, what we will see by then. Yeah. In my role as manager of regulatory affairs, um, I have to interact, and specifically I focus on e-mobility topics, advanced fuels, which, uh, as he mentioned, covers electric vehicles, covers uh, fuel, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but also covers advanced biofuels. And so I am aware of both internally what our portfolio is, what we're looking at as a company, but I also have to inform uh, back to headquarters what kind of conversations are occurring around these topics. And in my role, I deal with the regulators majority of the time, but I also have to deal with the legislators. And a big part of the problem that we are having right now is there's a lot, the topic of e-mobility is fairly new to most of the uh, legislators that I've talked to. And they're coming up with ideas that, although workable, really need a long-term vision. What I'm finding and what Daimler's finding, I imagine the other OEMs and gentlemen on this panel is, are finding, is that there isn't a long-term durable policy for these vehicles beyond 2020, 2025, when a large bulk of these cars are expected to be coming to the market. Um, that's one thing that we really need to have, is a, a multi-administration policy that directs what can be expected, what kind of fuels will be on the market, what's going to be supported as you go forward. Um, Daimler does believe that uh, electric vehicles have a, a market uh, the question is, what kind of market is it? Are they short commuter vehicles, short uh, distance commuter vehicles, or are they longer distance vehicles? We are seeing vehicles come in the market with 200, 300 mile potential ranges, very, very large batteries. And if those become the norm, I'm not saying they are, but if those become the norm in the marketplace, we're going to need an infrastructure to charge them that isn't being thought of right now. Um, and the infrastructure, as I'm sure my gentleman to the right can attest to, that is being looked at is a park model. But to get to those longer drive vehicles, we have to have infrastructure that can support a, uh, a fill model. And we're not there. And that means DC fast charge, or fast charge, should I say. There are other models of fast charge other than DC. But right now, the business case for DC is really a challenging one, at least from the outside looking uh, at it. And the Sherman gentleman to the right can attest to that issue. Um, but we really need to get our legislators to think about not just their term in office, but the legacy, the, the long-term issue of policy that will facilitate the advanced vehicles, not just electric, but hydrogen and biofuel in the marketplace in 2025 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, let's see, I, I thought we should start off with the moderated part of this discussion, learning a little bit more from 
those products already in the field? And maybe that's something for, for David from, from Nissan. So what have you learned from the Nissan Leaf that has been in the market now for about one and a half years, at least in the United States? And is there something like um, friends and family referrals that people have good expectations or good experience with their vehicles and then the friends and families buy one? Is it all these things like the neighborhood effect that some people always say, well, if my neighbor has an electric car, I'm going to buy one as well, and then together we are going to blow the local transform on the electric grid. And what is it like people might have initial concerns regarding range and so on, and do they come back after a couple of months and say, no problem at all? So what did you learn from the Nissan Leaf? So in terms of people's enjoyment with the vehicle, 100%, well, 90% <laughs> satisfaction. Uh, very high satisfaction. Um, some people do have mixed experiences with the vehicle, with the Nissan Leaf. Um, but overall, no problems um, with the vehicle at all, um, anywhere in the world. And it's uh, been enjoyed by, by over 30,000 people all over the world. Now, in terms of friends um, and family referrals, this is kind of hard to measure. Um, but certainly, I mean, we have, um, and they're, they're here today, amazing advocates. Um, the Bay Leafs, uh, so I see some representatives here in the audience. Um, they're an amazing uh, Leaf Association, Nissan Leaf Association of Drivers, um, and they're tremendous advocates um, for, for our technology and, and the vehicle. And certainly, I, I don't know, I've heard stories of you know, referrals for you know, 15, 20, 20 people buying a Nissan Leaf because of the Bay Leafs or their members. Mm -hmm. So really, um, our drivers and our early adopters are tremendous advocates for us. Now, as far as clustering effects and, and what that could mean for the electrical grid, I mean, we do share information with electric utilities about where the residential location of these vehicles are and mm -hmm. where they, so where essentially they will be charging at night. Um, so that gives utilities um, ample opportunity to upgrade their infrastructure. Now, as far as our early experiences with the LEAF, you know, it's been out a year and a half, as you said. Um, what's, there's different ways of looking at it. Um, in terms of driving behavior, we've been collecting a lot of data, and what we've been finding, actually, is that most drivers drive less than 50 miles a day. On an average, they drive 30 miles a day. Um, and the, the distance traveled uh, between when the vehicle is turned on and turned off, so a, a trip, is seven miles. That's the average distance. So what we're finding is that the, the battery range is actually more than sufficient, and we could have taken out more of that, that range, but of course, the buying decision, being as it is, we packed in more range. Um, and so the vehicle is meeting or exceeding people's needs. Um, and so that's, that's some initial feedback we've had. Um, in terms of charging behavior, it's been interesting. We've anticipated initially that most people would be using level two, and that's been happening. They've been charging at night uh, for about three hours using level two. But the, level, the usage of level one has been um, higher than expected. We expected 5%, and it's been actually around 15%. Um, so that's been interesting. In terms of sales, um, for the Nissan Leaf, uh, it's been interesting in terms of conquest. We've had 90% of, of Nissan Leaf drivers are actually new to the brand. And the number one conquest vehicle is, as was expected, um, to be the, the Toyota Prius. Um, we haven't seen as much pickup in fleet, and that has been, a lot of that has been due to to, um, I guess, budgetary situations in, in various uh, state and local government. Um, we did find that in, in the first year that more people were buying the vehicle than leasing the vehicle, which was interesting, um, because you had to actually have uh, the $7,500 $7, tax liability in order to, to take that federal, uh, interest, uh, federal tax credit. Um, and so we found that 90% were buying, but we're seeing now as we move through 2012 that more people are leasing the vehicle, moving mm -hmm. more towards that 20 to 30% um, lease uh, percentage of, of people that buy the vehicle that lease, uh, which is common across um, other Nissan vehicles. Um, and I mentioned the social and community aspect, which is tremendous. And um, the other thing we learned is, is that you can't uh, get out there enough and speak to the public about mm -hmm. um, the technology and right. familiarize them with mm -hmm. it. Maybe, I don't know, John, if you want to add to this, because the smart electric vehicle, I think, has not been launched in the U.S. market, but in other markets, is that correct? Is there some data that you have already from, from that program? 
actually, uh, the Smart Generation 2 was launched in very small numbers, around 250 cars, nowhere near what Nissan numbers are. Uh, but uh, in those vehicles, <clears throat> and the Smart Gen 3, we just announced a full production starting last week. Uh, but that will be initially in Europe, <clears throat> and we'll be bringing those cars over later this year to the US. Uh, and then a Mercedes branded version after that. With these vehicles though, we implemented uh, a smart charging unit that actually can gather data and ultimately with the right uh, electric vehicle charging unit communicate to the charging unit, to the customer of course, and eventually to the grid back end. Um, what that allows us to have is actually a truly smart grid. You, uh, you can't have a, a really smart grid that can't communicate with your, your vehicle and then tell the, the grid, okay, um, the charger's down or I'm having a problem, you know, you need to go to another charger. We believe that a vehicle has to be able to uh, tell where the charger's at, the grid has to be able to communicate, or the charger has to communicate, I'm up and running. So we're a little bit ahead of the game in bringing those cars to market, and I think our other competitors will also see the need to be able to communicate beyond just the car to charger uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the whole charging infrastructure, let's look a little bit more into that one with, with Pat. So it can be complicated from a technology standpoint, especially if we're going into smart charging, vehicle to grid communication, all of these things. But it can also be a very complicated thing from the regulatory side, I assume. So Pat, can you tell us a little bit more what it takes to establish a home charging unit, for instance, or maybe a parking lot with about 20 charging units. Sure. And um, also, who are maybe your main customers? Is it local municipalities? Is it parking structure operators? Is it employers who want to offer free charging to their, um, to their employees? So it's actually not that complicated. Uh, that's the good news. It's good. It's not, I, I should say it's not that complicated for level two. Mm -hmm. okay, for level three, a different story, much, much bigger. Uh, issue. I'll talk about level two first, and then I'll give you some updates on, on level three. And I'm not sure, sorry for interrupting, if everyone is really familiar with level two, level three, if you could briefly. Sure. Le level, level two is um, the, uh, uh, an, AC, an AC charging standard. Um, in the U.S., any car with a J1772 connector, it's the standard connector that's on just about every car that's sold in the U.S., um, is, is uh, accepting that. And it's basically charging at... Uh, um, you know, 208 or 240 volts, depending on whether you're at home or, or in a, uh, in a commercial area. Um, and it's passing that AC directly to the car, and the onboard charger on the car is dealing with charging the battery. So it's a lower power parking model, slowing, slower charging, uh, not too slow, but slower charging uh, mode for cars. It's significantly faster, uh, about 4x faster than level one, which is the AC outlet in your house. So when you buy an electric vehicle and you get what's called a travel cord in your trunk, it comes with the car and you plug it into an AC outlet, it's, a, it's a quite a bit faster than that. So it's probably the sweet spot for the parking model portion of this industry. And then level three uh, is a DC fast charging. That moves the charging electronics off board on, from the car to an external box. That external box tends to be uh, pretty large. Um, it can range up to 50 kilowatts, so it's a lot of power. Um, you're starting to see some 20 kilowatt DC chargers come out to kind of fill in that gap between the highest end that the uh, AC level two chargers can support and, and, and sort of the beginning of the DC chargers. Um, D, you know, DC can charge a car depending, and, and uh, I don't want to misquote here, Nissan Leaf I believe is somewhere around 20 minutes to 70, 80 percent thereabouts yeah, that's about in, that, in that range. Um, but it really is going to depend on the size of a battery pack. If you took a Tesla Model S and plugged it into a 50 kilowatt DC charger, you're still going to wait an hour and a half for thereabouts uh, to get up to 70, 80 percent, and it depends on the battery option. So his comment regarding large battery pack charging uh, for instantaneous fill model is even an even bigger issue. I, I, I don't actually think you can practically support an instantaneous fill model with, with large cars. Um, the issue with DC now, um, is that the transformer upgrades and your connection to the grid start to become a big factor. At most sites, they haven't uh, most commercial places, uh, workplaces, uh, city parking, things like that, they haven't contemplated a large number or even a small number of big instantaneous loads. So it's going to be a pretty important, I think, to couple storage uh, with DC charging en masse to uh, deal with the power issues. For level two, it's actually quite easy. 
Um, for permitting, for example, it's uh, you know a couple hundred dollars to permit a level two charger, whether you're at home or or, uh, or out in, in the public. So it's not a big permitting problem. Um, typically, because uh, on a public you know on a public street or in a parking garage or at a retail location, you have to trench because you have to pull pull power cables to the unit and you have to deal with you know, concrete or, or road work to cover that up and put the bolts in for the thing. It typically takes a couple of months to three mm -hmm. months. We're, we're seeing about a three month delay or so from purchase to provisioning on our network. Uh, so our provisioning model um, sort of lags our sales model by, you know, roughly a quarter or so, plus or minus. Also as a factor, the time of the year. If you're in Minnesota, there isn't a whole lot of trenching and concrete work going on uh, in the winter months. Uh, if you're in California, it's not as bad, so it's pretty uniform delay. So there's, this, there's a regional, there's a regional um, component to uh, the installation pitfalls around public charging at home. Obviously, there's less of an issue. It involves about the same complexity as putting a dryer plug in your garage, roughly speaking. Uh, so you can do that for anywhere between 800 and 1500 bucks is what we're seeing okay. for a licensed electrician to come out and do that. And you want to use a licensed electrician for this because you are dealing with, um, with, with high power stuff. A little, little bit about where these things are going. Um, pretty much everywhere he listed. Uh, well, that's the good news. You want them everywhere, right? Because we need, we need to charge our cars wherever we go. One of our philosophies is, you know, people are not going to change their daily course. Uh, to, to own an EV, they're going to buy an EV when they encounter enough infrastructure on the course that they normally travel. Um, there's a couple of examples we're seeing, um, for example, on parking companies, uh, this is just two examples we have a lot, Priority Parking and Pro Park are both customers of ours, they have pretty extensive implementations uh, around, uh, around the country. Uh, fleet operators, uh, we have a ton. Uh, but two that are, I think, uh, notable, County of Sonoma and the City of San Francisco. City of San Francisco being very, very much pro-electric um, uh, vehicle charging. County of Sonoma, I mentioned for one reason, it's very innovative what they've done. They've decided that for their fleet county vehicles, um, they, would, they wanted to double duty the charging infrastructure. And I think m most towns should do this. Um, instead of parking the fleet vehicles in a fleet garage, the electric fleet vehicles park where uh, park on the city streets, but they the parking spot is 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 reserved for city vehicles after five or six p.m. But in the normal business hours, when those fleet trucks are out doing their 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 daily work, it's an open charger for the public. So they double duty the charging infrastructure, and for a small town um, or even a mid-sized town, I think that's a great way of satisfying a governmental fleet need and bootstrapping the infrastructure in the industry. Um, so it's a pretty cool example of uh, some pretty innovative thinking up there in Sonoma. Uh, employers, you know, we have a ton. Um, you know, uh, companies, you know, we, you know, everyone likes to quote Google, they're one of our largest work, workplace employees. I actually don't because you know, everyone thinks they're an outlier. They're actually not. They're, they're, they're very progressive, but I think their buying patterns represent everyone else. We also have companies like SAP, Facebook, LinkedIn, and even outside the Bay Area, companies like 3M. We have retailers like Target, for example. The Target stores in Fremont uh, have a bunch of chargers. They're, they're, expanding that, uh, they're expanding that deployment to other stores. So you're seeing a very pervasive, very, very pervasive uh, um, uh, experimentation or piloting of EV charging. Um, last point, um, if, you, uh, if you look at our workplace customers and the phenomena that happens, they buy initially because um, a very vocal minority like, for example, the Bay Leafers, which by the way are a great group, I have to give them a, uh, uh, some props to uh, uh, Lunk David, um, they, they'll, they'll go to their employers when they buy a car and they'll say, hey look, you know, this is important, I need charging infrastructure at work, and the employers usually comply. Um, what happens is the minute they take the plunge, or a group like that in other areas of the country, the other person sitting in an office in the next building over happens to notice, oh my god, there's a charger and, and a leaf or a volt or whatever parked in front of it. I want one of those now because I was waiting for my employer. So then what happens to a T when we sell into a workplace is that workplace calls us a quarter later for a bigger order and a quarter later after that for a bigger order and it just keeps exploding because what happens is 
then more people want it, and then they put in more infrastructure, and then more people want it, and they put in more infrastructure, so it just catches fire. But it's important for that first vocal set of employees to push those employers to put that stuff in, because that's the tipper. That, that's, the, that's the first domino that falls in the chain. Okay, anyway, great. You. Well, Kilo, help me out here. Sounds all very good. <laughs> Sounds from, from all of the gentlemen here, and, and I really appreciate uh, that, uh, that overview. But one thing that uh, Jim Sweeney and I discussed in preparation for this seminar here, or for this discussion today, uh, the Toyota Prius also was mentioned. Certainly not the same vehicle, not exactly the same concept, but, but there are some analogies that might be looked at. And let's, let's just say the Toyota Prius has been in the market now for about 13 years. And if you check out the, the market share of all hybrid vehicles, then it's currently about 3% of all new vehicles. After 13 years of the initial market launch, 3% of all uh, vehicles in the United States are currently hybrid vehicles. And at Gartner, you work a lot with this hype cycle. Uh, explain that maybe a little bit to us, and, and can you explain or can you apply this to, to electrified vehicles as well? Sure, absolutely. And you know, I think it's good that we talk a lot about some of these measures that have to be in place, both from an infrastructure perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. But I actually like to go a step back, and because I think we still have another issue to deal with, which is much more important. We're talking really about a very, very small market at this point. And it's great to see that Nissan is selling quite a few cars. But if you think of the market share that electric vehicles today represent of all new vehicle sales, you're talking about less than 1%. So that's a really tiny, tiny fraction. The real problem, before we then have to worry about the infrastructure, the grid, and all of these other pieces, is how do we even get consumers to actually buy into those cars? And uh, you mentioned the hype cycle. For, for those of you that are familiar with Gartner, you may have seen this. It's a methodology that we use. It's a specific curve that shows how our technology over time matures. First, there's a lot of hype. It goes up um, probably beyond expectations, certainly beyond what consumers are looking for. And then it goes to the other extreme. People don't really care about it anymore. And eventually, it kind of normalizes. Um, think about e-business, for example, e-commerce, how that kind of exploded. A lot of companies started out, then they went out of business, and now e-business is pretty much business. It became normal. If I look at the electric vehicle on that hype cycle, I think we're getting close to actually what we call that, that trough of disillusionment, where you know, consumers and the industry realize that maybe some of these early expectations aren't really justified. And they want to really focus on that piece because I think that's becoming more and more important. Electric vehicles in my eyes today, even though I personally like them, and there are some of you out there in the audience that like them and bought them, have a marketability challenge more than anything else. Consumers do not see how these cars can replace the existing vehicles that they have, so it becomes almost a, a philosophical choice, maybe a secondary vehicle choice to buy into an electric vehicle because it does have limited range, because it is still too expensive. And I just want to give you a couple of, of data points. We do a lot of studies with consumers to understand their desires for different powertrain technologies. And if you ask consumers in the US, for example, what is it that you want to consider going forward? If you can choose between a traditional internal combustion engine that's using gasoline, diesel, maybe you have an electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, or even a gas-powered vehicle, consumers in the United States view the electric vehicle as something that's pretty much at the bottom of that list. 22% approximately say they definitely want to consider one going forward for the next vehicle purchase. 22%, that's a pretty high number. But as soon as you actually attach a price point to that, that number comes down very, very quickly to a much, much smaller percentage. And just to, to give you an example there as well, we found that those 22% said they're willing to buy an electric vehicle if there's no price difference, or if it's maybe up to $4,000 more expensive than a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle. So that's a huge disconnect still today to really get consumers over that hump. And I think a lot of that has to do with the expectation that consumers have, but also to some extent with the car manufacturers push in terms of getting these vehicles to consumers. In many cases, I don't think that electric vehicles today can be a substitute for a traditional vehicle. I had an interesting discussion actually with a reporter from KQED earlier this week. She wanted to come down and visit me from San Francisco in San Jose, and she has a, a Nissan Leaf. Um, but she wanted to know if we have a charging station at our office, and unfortunately we don't, so maybe I have to talk to you, Pat, about this. <laughs> but she couldn't make that trip, so, because that's out of the range if she hasn't really charged the car fully 100%. So she had to go to what she calls her backup car. 
in California, having a backup car is much more feasible than it is for the average consumer and vehicle owner outside of California. And that's something we have to keep in mind as well. So I may sound a little bit more skeptical on this. I think the industry is getting a little bit more cooling, cooled off to that whole idea as well. Just to give you another data point, last year around this time, vehicle manufacturers said that in the United States it will sell 100,000 electric vehicles. That was the goal that they had. I don't think we'll ever get close to that over the next couple of years because there are still these hurdles that need to be addressed. Okay. Where's your office, Tilo? Uh, in San Jose, near, nearby the airport. You're going to donate? A no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's plenty of apps out there to find a charging station. If they always work. That's the other problem. So, you know, another big element of this is how do you make this experience as seamless as possible? Mm -hmm. Right, and um, I think definitely that the electric vehicle will be a por portion or an element of powertrain mixes going forward that the car industry has to deal with, no question about it. Um, and if you can find these charging stations, you take out the headache of consumers having to find that next charging spot and, and reserving it and so on. But the data has to be good, and that's still all very much emerging. So consumers take a leap of faith to buy into this and to say, I just completely rely on this and I'm good. Um, I think we're getting better on this, but it's very difficult from a consumer market perspective and from the automotive industry perspective because the car manufacturers have to balance all of these different powertrain technologies going forward. That costs a lot of money. And for those of you that are uh, very much involved in the auto industry, you may have seen the announcement today that now BMW and Toyota will collaborate on fuel cell technology going forward. Why? Because it's damn expensive to do that on your own to the extent that now car manufacturers are willing to actually share resources and do this jointly together. That's another challenge, even from an industry perspective. There's maybe some question for, for the automotive industry. All these different technologies, diesel, gasoline, hybrid, electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles, how do you balance those technologies? And, and would there be a winner? Um, Any? I think actually Mercedes is working on all of those technologies. We have fuel cell, we have battery electric, we have we're working on um, diesel hybrid vehicles. We're working on standard hybrid vehicles. And it's really too early to say you know, who's the winner. I mean, if we could, if I had a crystal ball, I'd be a billionaire and the richest person in the world, but I don't. So we have to look at what is our consumer going to want. I mean, the consumer is ultimately the decider of the success of this technology, any technology in the marketplace. And being Mercedes, our demographic consumer is very picky. They have come to expect the best, and it better work. And uh, a part of that is they're, gonna ha they're going to require uh, whatever technology they choose. If it's a primary vehicle, it's got to get them wherever they want to go uh, without any real challenges. They've got to be able to find the fueling station on their GPS. It's got to take them there, and it better be up and running. Or it better tell them it's not running, go to another one. And if you start thinking about that whole dynamic, uh, not to get off to, to the left a bit, but the electric vehicle is supposed to reduce emissions. You start thinking about it though, if you start, if you have a vehicle that cannot tell you, uh, or communicate with the grid, that the station you're heading for is not f up and running or it's actually being utilized already, when you get there and see that, you're gonna drive to another one, which means you're gonna actually increase emissions by trying to find a working station, a functioning or a station that's not being used. So we actually need to develop for electric vehicles to actually take hold. The consumer has to have an experience like they currently have, where it will take them to a gas station. They need to be taken to in a working, usable uh, charging station. That's something we're not there yet. We need to work on that. Pat, what do you think? I actually think we're there. Um, we actually provide <laughs> telematics feeds to every major telematics company out there and direct to some auto OEMs like Nissan it's in dash, it's live. You see if it's, uh, uh, you will in, on certain cars. Right now, some of the feeds are static, but in most cases, they're moving to active feeds into the car through direct coupling to our network. So you will see station status, reservability, price, um, all kinds of stuff. Plus, if you just go to the App Store, Android, iPhone, whatever, download, our, download ChargePoint on your phone, it's direct hookup to our network. It'll give you mapping functions, the lo station location, station status. Um, and so I'm not saying that uh, it's perfect, uh, but it, the, the infrastructure is there, at least on our network, and we're the dominant network in the US. Uh, so for US drivers, um, you know, we're, we're getting there. We're actually mm -hmm. going to, you know, we're expanding those functionalities into other markets globally. Um, 
And I think um, what I do agree with is the auto OEMs are, are pushing very hard for this because they all to a T realize that that's um, an absolute requirement. Comment on, on electric fuel. Electric fuel is fungible. You can make it from anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, have a, I have a Fisker Karma. It's a gas electric hybrid. I have what I affectionately refer to as gas anxiety. I hate when that gas engine comes on. <laughs> I do everything I possibly can to make it not come on. Um, and I rarely have to think about it because most of my driving is inside, as David put, inside the 30 mile range a day or what have you, and my battery pack gives me more than that, so rarely do I use gas. But I have no range anxiety because mm -hmm. I know at the end of the day that if that engine does come on, I can always get where I need to go, even though I try not to drive on it because I like it. I like the, the, just the silence of that vehicle. But there are a lot of benefits to an electric car. We have to stop selling electric cars purely on the basis of economics and fuel. Um, they're faster. Uh, their acceleration's better. There's no transmission. Um, if you look at my car, it doesn't have to look like, a, like an economy. There's a certain segment of the market where it has to look like an economy car, and I think that's right. But you can make the nicest sports car on the industry, in the industry, which I think the Karma is, or you can go all the way down to you know, a very successful platform like the Leaf and make something that's targeted at the best economy possible for, you know, for, for a driver and fill in all those price points. So I think the market's just got to stop talking about this as if it, it's just a different fuel option. And you've got plenty of choice out there. You've got plenty of range. And you know, thinking that we're going to put in tons of infrastructure to change the, the, the other side of the hybrid equation, I think is foolish. I don't think we're going to get into a hydrogen economy where we're going to refit gas stations with hydrogen tanks and, and, and use hydrogen fuel cells or mm -hmm. anything like that. I think it's gasoline because that's what's there and there's plenty of distribution and hopefully not much needed. And then there's battery packs. And by the way, that electricity, I, I love to tell people about what my car runs on because they ask me. And I say, well, it, 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 it's some days it's a wind car. Other days it's solar powered, sometimes it's clean coal, sometimes it's not so clean coal, sometimes it's a gas turbine, meaning the source of those electrons, right, will naturally get cleaner over time, but they come from different places, and over time, mass generation will basically clean itself up, and you want the endpoints to already be electric because it's the most fungible source of power that we have. So we've just got to focus on making you know, the electric car, the, the battery differential on an electric car come into range. And I think what David said is right. We really got to question how much range we need in batteries over time as there's an awareness. As battery technology comes up the curve, I don't think, I don't think it gets plowed into a two, 300 mile range battery. I think it gets plowed into a $20,000 entry point on an EV. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes it happen. Yeah, so if you want to drive a, a luxury car made from Nissan, Pat, I do drive the future Infinity LE. I've seen it. It's a great looking car. <laughs> so it's coming. So it's, it's a great coming. looking car. Um, it's coming. But we also have other ones that are coming. We have the Nissan ENV 200. That's an all electric cargo van, uh, cargo passenger van that's going to be manufactured in Barcelona. Um, and that will be available in the United States. So we're building electric vehicle technology for multiple applications for different consumers um, in the market. But we're not taking a zero sum approach to to powertrain technologies. Um, and your comment on you know, substitutes, I mean, is it a one-for-one -one substitute? Am I replacing my vehicle that I have today with an electric vehicle? I mean, that's, that's my question to you. And Nissan surely doesn't think that. I mean, we're, we're looking at 10% of new auto sales for Nissan by 2020. Not 100%, not 50%, sure. 10%. And our focus is that 22% that are considering an electric vehicle, we want them to be our customers. That's what we want. And we understand that. And you raised valid points, you know, range, um, which we think can be addressed by education, because it doesn't need to be a 200, 300 mile um, range vehicle. It couldn't be, you know, 50. Sure. No, but we, we decided we, we had to find the right balance between, between cost and range. And that, that's what the Nissan Leaf is today. But you're absolutely right that prices do need to come down in order to, to make this a truly mass market vehicle. No, abs absolutely. You know, and it, I think this is all correct, all the things that are heard today. But at the end of the day, if you buy an electric vehicle to add to your personal fleet and you still have other cars to fall back into, if you have to go that longer range, you know, then it becomes really a, a cost factor for a lot of consumers. Right? Let's not forget this. Um, overall, consumer interest in cars, even long term, would probably be lower than it is today. 
So do consumers really want to buy that many vehicles just to be green and be electric at some point and then be able to actually still get from A to point B if they really need to at no on another day? So I think it's becoming very difficult for consumers to justify all of these pieces. Ultimately, I believe, and, and Pat said this, you know, we have been saying this for many years, as an electric car, you really have to rationally convince consumers that it can do the things that you're looking for, but you have to emotionally wow them. That is something that you really want to have. Tesla is a good example for doing this because worrying about a powertrain technology is not something consumers really want to do unless they're really into the technology themselves and that's not the average consumer that you have. So I do believe that this becomes more and more of an issue going forward and I always tell people in a joking way that you know, they're, what, what do sports cars and electric cars have in common? You both cars you cannot really rationalize based on cost today. They're both a commitment. So, you know, if, if any of you have a spouse who don't believe that you should have a sports car, go and convince them. It's the same like an electric vehicle. You, know, you can't really justify it. But you know, that's really the challenge that we have with a lot of these vehicles. So you asked the question at the beginning, what will happen by 2020? We believe that by 2025 to 8 percent of all new vehicles sold will be battery enabled. Doesn't mean fully electric mm -hmm. vehicles. That means Can a lot of these hybrid. will be hybrids, mm -hmm. a lot of them. Because it's just like that Fisker Karma, that gives you that peace of mind. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Chevy Volt, the same thing. Now, there will be lots of applications for using a fully electric vehicle like the, the Nissan Leaf. Um, and I think you may actually see completely different types of vehicles that we don't even consider today that will allow you to get mobility and that could be electric. But from a government uh, point of view, even from a leg legislative point of view, I'm not sure that the governments are doing the right thing by just focusing on one technology only. Uh, I tell people maybe we should all get a check in the mail from the government that gives us a thousand dollar tax refund so that you can buy a bicycle and stop using gas because maybe you start using a bicycle then for some of the rights. That would be a much more broader approach to looking into how to get away from oil and some of the other issues that governments are worried about. So we are getting towards the end of the panel, unfortunately. I definitely wanted to get into that question of incentives as well, but I also would like to open up to, to questions from the audience, and I prefer that we go to the questions from the audience. There's someone is already waiting, and hopefully there are questions about incentives maybe that we catch uh, to things with one. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting uh, uh, conversations. Um, this question is uh, uh, for Pat. Um, I'm very, very spoiled by your app. You know, I, I want to know, uh, will you, do you, does uh, Coulomb has any plan to incorporate other brand of charger into your map? It was just wonderful. Then the second question is for uh, the, the Nissan and, uh, and the Mercedes. And uh, it would be so much nicer if, you, if your map in the car could incorporate what Coulomb has saying all the available uh, or not available or which one is being charged or which one is broken on your map, that would be just wonderful because right now it, it's just very limited and it updates very, very slow, like once a month or it's just too slow. It needs to be updated just like Coulomb. And uh, this is for Steve. Steve, I'm sorry, you're a bad boy. You took out the SPI charging stations out from the visitor center. That's the one and only one uh, SPI charger that uh, you promised uh, to leave a year ago. I don't know why you took it out. I took my Rav4 here today and it's gone. Okay. Okay, let's start with okay. Pat. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for the comment. Um, it's a great question. I've, I've gotten that question at every panel that I've spoken on. We are definitely incorporating um, chargers that are not on our network into our app. We don't think it does a service to, we're not trying to make money on drivers. Uh, and we know the driver, and we also understand that to make the industry great, um, we, can't be, we can't be focused just on our network because it's just drivers won't use multiple applications. So we're going to go broad with our, uh, with our application and, and include uh, locations of stations that are not necessarily on our network. Um, there's limits to what we can get. Um, if we don't have a direct feed from those network providers, the, the other network providers, it's difficult for us to get station status. We're happy to do a, uh, 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 an integration with them to be able to get the station status, meaning is someone parked there or not. I think that's an important factor. Um, but uh, we're already, for example, in our feed to Nissan, um, we already provide uh, station data that is not on our network and we're in the process of making that part of our, our uh, full production suite. It's just rolling out. It's just not there yet, but it'll be there. So yes, totally agree. I feel your pain. 
Um, it definitely needs to be updated more frequently, the, the, um, the charging station database. Totally agree with you, and we're working on improvements all the time, and your feedback is absolutely essential to that. Um, but we do make sure that the chargers that are out there are able, are compatible with the Nissan LEAF, and so we do test those and th make sure those are compatible before they show up on the map. So you might be seeing some delays because of that if there's a new manufacturer on the market, but absolutely, um, thank you for the feedback. Actually, you've made my point uh, more specifically that the information about the status of the charger station needs to be something that any GPS installed in a vehicle can access whether it be a Coulomb system, Ecotality, or some other provider who isn't even in the market yet, um, there needs to be a, a, a tie-in between the final permitting of public station to a statewide database which feeds out to GPS or navigation systems. Uh, that would drive customers who aren't necessarily Coulomb uh, to their charging. They need to charge, they're going to go to Coulomb, they're going to go to whoever's there. If they're not a subscriber, charge them a little more. I'd rather charge someplace available than try to find one that is in my network. Um, so, at, at some point, though, the federal government may need to figure out how to require there to be a database that is accessible to any OEM's GPS navigation system. And it's great that Coolum provides it, but it's something that every uh, manufacturer uh, has to have in their cars and, and accessing every public charger that is available. So we're working on getting these aggregators, actually. Um, there's plenty of aggregators out there in the market. Um, I could just name, if you want to look them up, go download them. Recargo, PlugShare, um, there's, there's plenty. I mean, check out the Coolum app. They do this. Um, yeah, there he is. Go talk to this guy. Um, PlugShare. Um, they do this already. And, I mean, we're looking to incorporate this into, into our future vehicles for sure. I mean, this is an obvious um, next, next, uh, next move for us. But... Um, yeah, it just needs to be improved, but it already exists. Certainly it exists. Um, it's accessible um, with PlugShare. I mean, you can, you can upload your own. I mean, it's really a crowdsourced um, app, I mean, for, for diff different charging opportunities. And it aggregates um, not just PlugShare, but many other applications do this. They aggregate across different uh, network providers. You can get Coolon, you can get EcoTalent, well, ChargePoint Network, you can get the Blink Network. You can get um, other networks that are sharing their information, um, static or, or dynamic. Um, if they have open APIs or not. I mean, this is happening right now, and it's some of the most robust um, maps are actually from, from apps, not from your traditional uh, navigation services providers. But they're so, getting there. But they're getting there, yeah. Getting there. I would love to have an answer for you for the mission, missing charging spot, but since I don't, I'd like to give the next question to Mr. Schultz. I have a question about the Nissan LEAF and the other electric cars. I might say, I drive a Nissan LEAF. I have solar panels on my house here on campus, long since paid for them by the amount of electricity on my bill that I've saved. So I figure I'm driving on sunshine, and there's plenty of it around here, and it's free. So it's a hell of a deal. Thank but you. I look at the Nissan LEAF, and I say to myself, it's all off the shelf. There's a chassis. Nothing different about that. There's an electric motor, like the motor's been around for a long time. They're very efficient, they're good. And there's a battery. The battery's a lot better than the one I had when I drove an EV1. And listening to the battery characters around Stanford, and it's quite obvious that five years from now they're gonna be a lot better. But <clears throat> what puzzles me is the lighter the vehicle is, the further you can go on a given amount of energy. And there are composite materials around that are very, very strong. Boeing uses them building into their airplanes, so they work. And they're much lighter. So why isn't Nissan and the other companies looking into a chassis and more pieces of their automobiles made out of this light, strong material? So thank you, first of all, for, for being one of the early adopters of, of the Nissan LEAF. Um, and we are looking into more advanced materials. Um, but, and I'm not a product planner, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a trade-off between performance and cost. And I believe that the, 
the engineers and the research that, that went into producing the Nissan LEAF um, did the best they could in, in finding that balance. But I agree with you that we need to continue to innovate um, and to lighten the vehicle and to improve the range of the vehicle. It's definitely a cost issue, though. It's a huge cost issue, right? Because you could use carbon, other light uh, weight materials, um, even magnesium and other components, but it, the cost would just go through the roof. And that's the problem, especially if you also have to have a lot of safety technology on board, uh, crumple zones and everything else in the car. That's the problem that's behind this. You will see some of those cars that are very light. BMW with the i brand will offer a couple of vehicles that primarily use carbon for a lot of the components. And there are lots of investments, huge investments in the automotive industry to make this work. But it's happening very, very slowly because the manufacturing processes just aren't there. It would be much easier for all of us, even if you don't have an electric vehicle, if you would have lighter cars because the fuel efficiencies would be much, much better than what we have today. Think about this. Most of us drive a car, if you have an average size vehicle, of 3,000 pounds around to move a body of maybe 100, 100 something pounds around. That's crazy if you think about it. So things should change going forward. John? Mercedes actually has a, a huge program internally ju just to focus on the reduction of weight. And we, as some of our production vehicles on the higher end, uh, such as our AMG line, have these uh, carbon fiber and completely aluminum chassis on them. But to give you an example, um, a standard steel hood, cost of production might be around three to $500. Then you get an aluminum hood, $750, $1,000. You go to carbon fiber, it's a $2,500 hood. So the, uh, on a higher end car, you can absorb those costs if the customer is willing to pay for the cost difference and the perform, uh, for the performance they're getting. But uh, unless you can make up for that cost difference in volume, it's not really cost effective right now to replace many of the current lightweight technologies. Uh, and I say current because there are some very advanced materials that is being worked on. Uh, carbon fibers, single layer carbon fiber materials versus the multi-laminate layers we have now that we think will have a place in the marketplace in the future. But right now, the cost uh, efficiency just isn't there on low volume production. One more question over there. And I think then we unfortunately need to come to an end. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Verma, and I am an R&D in the silicon industry. Uh, question is, the biggest so stopper for the cost of the electric vehicle is the battery, lithium niobate. What is the progress in that area from panel's point of view? Because generally, battery R&D is very slow pace for last 50 years. Until unless you don't come out the fast R&D in the battery, cost reduction, lighter battery, cost will not come down. Any comment in that area? Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. You know, there are some interesting new technologies looking at um, into how you can make the batteries more efficient, more compact, and therefore also have lower weight. But I haven't seen the breakthrough yet. You know, I do anticipate that batteries probably every year will be getting better, maybe 2 3% in terms of range. If you buy a Chevy Volt now, new model year, you get, I think, a couple more miles than in previous years. And I think the same is true for some of the newer you know, batteries that will be deployed in, in the Nissan Leaf going forward. So you see incremental small steps to improve the, the technology and the range but nothing is yet really a breakthrough that uh, we can project will happen within this decade. I hope that will happen. That would change the equation completely. Uh, companies are working on this. I wish that governments would put more money into funding research projects for battery than for some of the other aspects that we're talking about because that's going to really change the equation for all of this. Well, for Nissan, it's two vectors. It's, yes, innovation, and then also scale. So with the increased manufacturing capacity, increased scale, you're gonna drop the cost of the batteries. But Couple that with innovation, and it's starting to look a lot better. So there's an interesting phenomenon in the battery industry right now. They're all forward priced. It causes some pain for some of the smaller manufacturers because it, it, it puts their cost structure out of bed with what you know, car companies like this are buying batteries for, but it also puts the industry on a faster treadmill. So if they don't bring the manufacturing costs down to the batteries, they, they bleed more. Uh, so that 50-year pattern that you talked about, that was before electric vehicles were putting significant cost pressure on lithium-ion battery packs. Now there's so much cost pressure, it's a do or die. They have to get out of the, out of, out of the situation they're in or, you know, it's just not a very profitable space. So it should, it should cause natural selection to happen. Being a chemical engineer, I have a slightly different take on your question. <laughs> Um, looking at nanotitanate materials, anodes and cathodes, uh, there's a lot of advances that have been made there. But the, there are some basic issues with 
the energy storage, specific energy and density storage of a device that you are intrinsically trying to pull materials out of to reduce cost. I mean, the material is where the energy is being stored at, and you've got your electron movement across the membranes and so forth. I won't go into that. But there are some fundamental issues with existing lithium batteries that it's just going to, you can't be on the physics. You can't overcome certain physical boundaries. So we're going to have to look at maybe some other materials or take the existing materials and put them in different uh, lattices, if you will. But beyond that, there is still the issue of even if you get a battery the size of a shoebox that can ho has enough energy density, power density, to go uh, take a vehicle 500 miles, you still have to get the energy from somewhere. You still have to charge that. Uh, I don't think that's the direction we need to go to just decrease the size. It's, it's all about cost. But right now, we're just not seeing the cost efficiencies in these more advanced battery technologies. We're seeing battery prices increase, but we're not seeing existing technology prices go down because they're having to reduce materials to do that. I, I'm afraid we have to come to an end. I think we can say at, at the end of this great panel that, that we learned a lot that there's a lot of technology out there, but it's not that easy that we just put a turbocharger and a catalytic converter to a car and just gets better. Obviously, there's a lot of behavioral change necessary, and I think what was very clear here that really communication between the industry, the government, and the consumers needs to happen, and I hope that this gave some direction, some things to think about for all of you here uh, throughout this panel and really wanted to thank our esteemed panel for being here and for the audience asking great questions and being part of this panel. Thanks a lot. Thanks.